Hello, Device Talkers. I'm Kayleen Brown of Device Talks. Thank you for tuning in onto another episode of Device Talks AI. So today's episode brings together three of my personal passions, artificial intelligence, women's health, and cancer research and diagnostics. So artificial intelligence, I mean, that's why we're here. We're learning how large OEMs and medical device stakeholders are integrating artificial intelligence into their devices for better outcomes. There's been a lot of emphasis on women's health, not just my personal interest in it, but the industry at large has been really taking a serious look at women's health. There's new clinical evidence that's stating we need to design our devices differently based off of diverse anatomies. So that being said, our editorial director, Tom Salemi, has gifted me an incredible opportunity to craft my own track at Device Talks West this October 16th and 17th. So on the 17th, I'm going to feature two panel discussions that dig into what I just overviewed. We're going to rethink device design for diverse anatomy. We're going to consider new evidence, and we're going to focus on conditions that impact all patient populations, not just the female patient population, but conditions that impact everybody, because women's health is all health. We're going to hear from the senior leaders from large OEMs how they are considering device design for women's health. Later on in the afternoon, we're also going to look at concept to care. So one of the big industry asks that I've heard over the last year has been to get all the different stakeholders and diverse perspectives to sit at the same table to discuss device design. That's what we're trying to do. So we're bringing together stakeholders from the FDA, clinical affairs, engineering, business leadership, and even clinical practice to talk about how we are designing medical devices for women, considering the evidence, considering the challenges, and having a very candid, candid conversation as to what we need to do differently so that those devices have better outcomes. For 51 plus percent of the population, I really hope that you join us. Again, that's October 16th to the 17th. The Women's Health Track will be on the 17th, but there's some incredible content on the 16th as well. So please join us to see the agenda and to see who our speakers are. Uh, please go to west.devicetalks.com. Again, that is going to be October 16th and 17th in Santa Clara. The conference will be at the Santa Clara Convention Center, and you can go to west.devicetalks.com to view the agenda, see the speakers, and explore our many, many networking receptions. We're actually even doing a Women in MedTech luncheon that is going off of the success of our Women in MedTech breakfast. So please join us for that. You don't have to be a woman to join. You just have to be an ally. So that's going to be on October 17th. I really hope that I see you there. Okay. So at the start of the episode, I talked through the three passions, artificial intelligence, women's health, and then cancer diagnostics and research. Today's episode we really dig into cancer research and diagnostics through our two interviews, one with Hologic and one with TCAN. But before digging into those interviews, I wanted to share why that's a passion of mine. So in 2008, I had just started the first full year of my big career job. I had left university the year prior, and I joined a medical device intelligence company. It was the start of my journey into medical devices. And right at the beginning of it, my mother was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. For those who don't know, multiple myeloma is the cancer of the blood. So there is no way to cure that particular cancer. My mother can go into remission. However, it's not it's not really the same definition of remission as we think. 
Typically, my mother's cancer comes back every five years. But that's actually a really good thing. I know it may not seem like a good thing that my mom had cancer or has cancer since 2008, but when she was first diagnosed, she was told that she has three months to live. I had just started a new career. I was four hours away from my mom. My brothers and I all moved home. We changed everything in our lives to spend those last three months with her. Because of my advantages, because of my, out of pure luck, I happen to have been in the best industry in the world. And because of my relationships that were starting to blossom in the industry, I was given a lot of research. I was given a lot of hope. I was able to understand what potential treatments are out there. And I was able to bring this optimism and hope into my family when we needed it the most. The clinicians, the researchers, the the nurses, I mean, everybody, everybody, everybody saved my mom's life. That was in 2008. I don't know if you're doing the math, but my mother has survived far past three months. And though we are still going through the every five year cycle and we're in it currently right now, my mother is still alive and she is alive because of this incredible industry, because of the stakeholders and the people who sacrifice for this industry. And that brings me to today's episode. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Michael Quick, the Vice President of R&D and Innovation at Hologic. In the interview, Mike shares how a serendipitous encounter with a clinical trial paves his way to cytology mastery. We talk about the first FDA-approved cytology system, Hologic's genius digital diagnostic system, and how that system represents a major advance in cervical cancer screening by incorporating the genius cervical AI algorithm to enhance the accuracy and efficiency of diagnostics. So we have AI, women's health, and cancer research. It's the trifecta, my friend. And to make it even more women's health, Mike says during the interview, and I quote, that Hologic is at its core, a women's health company. And that's not all. Interspersed throughout the Hologic interview, I have the opportunity to sit down with TCAN's Chief Technology Officer, Dr. Wael Yared, to learn more about TCAN's significant influence in cancer research and diagnostics. Specifically, we dig into the 40-year history of pioneering innovations in genomics and cell biology and TCAN's innovative approach to automating sample handling and diagnostics workflow. Plus, I got the skinny on Tekin's approach to AI. This is a jam-packed episode, and I'm so looking forward to getting it started. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Quick, VP of R&D and Innovation at Hologic. Mike Quick, Vice President, Research and Development and Innovation for Cytology Oncology at Hologic. Thanks so much, Mike, for joining me on Device Talks AI. I've been so looking forward to this interview, so really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Kaylee. Looking forward to it. Excellent. So I always like to start my interviews with an understanding of how you found your way into the medical device industry. So I've been here for almost two decades, and it's the best industry in the world. So what did your path look like? Yeah, probably not a, a very typical one. I was uh, pre-med originally um, and decided I wanted to do something different and got involved in laboratory science as a cytologist. It was something I hadn't even ever heard about before, um, but loved the idea of people working in a laboratory diagnosing cancer for patients that didn't know that they had it um, and you know, learned about the field and got involved. Um, and, and so I was in school. And while I was a student there, the, the company that I now work for was actually doing a clinical trial at that site where I was a student. So I had exposure to the technology early on and thought, hey, I'd love to get involved um, with this. And so when I graduated, um, I called the company and said, hey, I'd love to learn more about this. This looks like a great, exciting future. And they're like, you've got no experience <laughs> in the field and we're still trying to figure out our place um, in the world. And so it was a great way for me to then get involved um, working in laboratories for a number of years. And then I actually came back as a customer um, before um, 
you know, I became an employee. And while I was there for a training class, um, I was recruited and um, that was almost 30 years ago. Um, and so it's been really neat. That, you know, I don't know if you remember the hair club for men um, <laughs> when they said, I'm not only a, 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 a owner, I'm a, I'm a customer. Um, and that's where I came from. Um, and so really had firsthand experience as a end user sitting behind a microscope and thinking, my gosh, there's got to be better ways to do this. Um, having no idea that I would play a role um, in that 30 years later. That is really special because I always say that the medical device industry is really familial, but I've always sort of thought about it as a more linear pathway, but it's, you were really born sort of into the industry. <laughs> so you can never leave. I think that's- I don't think the... so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really special. So then how did you go from- being sort of behind the microscope, as you put it, to um, being in front of it. I mean, you had indicated that you were problem solving ways to do things better, but could you give us maybe an example or um, just more color? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, being behind the microscope, you learn quickly that, well, it's amazing technology that existed um, and really no test had been involved that had a bigger impact on diagnosing cancer for almost 50 years um, than the test for cervical cancer. And so while it was incredibly um, powerful in what it was able to do, there were still shortcomings. And again, being the person behind the microscope, I mean, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of cells trying to find that proverbial needle in a haystack and thinking there had to be a better way to do that. And so that my journey, you know, has been a, a very interesting one and taking me a lot of different paths, but really recognizing that there was need for even um, improved technology where we could have a bigger impact on diagnosing cancer for these patients. And so moving from, you know, initially started off as, you know, training and supportive role, um, eventually into product development, um, recognizing that it wasn't the engineering background um, that was necessary. It was about what was the unmet need um, and being able to orient around how can we solve for that um, and really have that view from a customer's perspective um, and how we can make a difference. Very, very well said. That's a very common theme across all of my interviews and conversations I have with senior leaders in this space. It's really identifying that need, not creating a solution to a problem that doesn't exist, but really right. trying to solve a problem that really does exist. And I love that. And that brings us to Hologic and your recent news. So first, congratulations on your recent FDA clearance for Hologic's Genius Digital Diagnostic System. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so Mike, from what I understand, that's the first and only FDA cleared digital cytology system. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's always hard to be first. <laughs> um, you're kind of paving a, a new path. Um, but we worked very closely with the regulatory agencies first in Europe and then in the U.S. Um, to get FDA clearance to be able to bring this technology to the market. Well, I'm definitely champing at the bit to learn more about your FDA pathway. Uh, you couldn't be more right. And especially when we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's all sort of new paths. I mean, for every indication, for every new technology, for um, algorithms, you know, AI assisted algorithms or enabled algorithms. I mean, it's all sort of writing the script from scratch. So very much looking right. forward to getting into that. Before we go so granular, I want to get a better understanding if this is really the first FDA cleared system and it's first cytology, why did Hologic decide that this is what was worth pursuing? Um, and were there any specific gaps or problems as we were just talking about problems you're trying to solve? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So, um, you know, at, at our heart, while we we certainly focus at a lot of different areas in terms of healthcare, um, we are at our core a women's health company. Um, and, you know, two of the areas that we've largely focused on are solutions and technologies around breast cancer and cervical cancer. We're the, the market leader in those two areas, uh, both with digital mammography and our cytology and molecular um, testing platforms that we do um, for patients. And what we found is that, um, that there really was a, lo a lot of challenging problems that our customers were facing. Um, one of the, the key ones is a, a shortage of expert resources. So while cytology is incredibly effective at diagnosing cervical cancer and its precursor lesions early, the skilled personnel that do that 
are becoming fewer and fewer um, in the field. We're seeing, um, you know, schools are shutting down left and right. There aren't as many people going into the field. And yet the volume of testing is still very significant. Millions of women are tested every year, um, you know, with the pap test. And so how can we continue to provide that life-saving service, um, you know, in a way that's more efficient with the resources that are available um, in terms of being able to, you know, bring, bring technology solutions to address the human um, challenge that's there? Uh, there's definitely, I mean, how long would you say that this shortage has been around? I mean, 10 years, easy, and just seems like it keeps getting worse and worse. As, yeah, there's been about a 35% decrease um, in the number of cytologists and pathologists that are taking the, the proficiency test each year. Um, that's been happening for about the past 10 to 15 years um, and, and keeps getting fewer and fewer. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, it's life-saving technology. This is a routine screening test that should be part of every woman's, um, you know, routine care um, in terms of screening for cervical cancer, um, you know, following professional guidelines. But if, if that resource isn't available, it becomes harder and harder harder for laboratories to be able to offer that to women. I mean, you hit the nail on the head in so many different ways and uh, very candidly, and we can always cut this out, but very candidly, I actually have had cervical cancer and this was before the screenings oh were mandated, uh, which was such a game changer. And before um, there was sort of steps in place to help avoid as much as possible that and it was mm -hmm. it's it was a very very scary experience and to your point mike there's there were no resources there wasn't even really a vocabulary around it and certainly there was shame so it wasn't something that we were able to even really discuss and when you hear cancer i mean everything stops you know so to know that there are resources maybe now in place. There are technologies that are certainly catching up. And there are innovators like yourself who are really trying to solve this problem. The young, much younger Kayleen is thanking you. And the Kayleen today is saying that our future is much, much brighter. So thank you uh, for all you're doing. Let's thank you for it, sharing that. <laughs> I really, yeah, but, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate you, the vulnerability and sharing that, Kayleen, too, because it, it's why we do what we do. Um, you know, we, we recognize that behind every slide that, you know, someone may look at under a microscope, that there's a patient behind that with a story, a family, um, and an experience. And that's, it's what drives us to continue to innovate, to continue to make sure the message is out there, that awareness is there, um, because that's where the key is to being able to make sure that we can do everything we can to make that not happen to other women. Oh melt. You see how quickly I was just dismissing, you know, here I was sharing this vulnerable story and then it was like, no, let's not talk about it. Let's move on. We still have ways to go, Mike. So thank you for <laughs> pulling me back and making me hear you. And I really appreciate that. And you're right. Sure. Behind every microscope, there's an actual patient, an actual life and families that are affected by that. We'll take a quick break from my interview with Mike Quick of Hologic to sit down with Dr. Yael Yared, Chief Technology Officer of TCAM. Dr. Yael Yared, Chief Technology Officer TCAN, thank you very much for joining me on Device Talks AI. I'm looking forward to sitting down with you today. Thank you, Kayleen. Thanks for the invitation, and I look forward to our conversation. And please call me Yael. Okay, fabulous. So, Yael, I always like to start my interviews at a 40,000 foot level. So I know that TCAN has many capabilities and a lot of influence in the medical device industry, but I'm hoping that you can help us better understand what is TCAN's role in life sciences, in vitro diagnostics, and medtech, but specifically in relation to med but specifically in relation to cancer research. Of course, and, and thank you for the invitation, Kayleen. So TCAN is a well-established player in the life sciences, in vitro diagnostics, medtech, and general healthcare space overall. We've been in this, in this business for well over four decades on multiple continents. We're based in Europe, but of course have operations in Europe, in North America, in Asia. And we develop uh, cutting edge, state of the art platforms and solutions that are applicable to these spaces, including of course in cancer research. And in particular, we work with uh, external partners as well. We, we, we work with both established leaders and technology disruptors in the life sciences and in medtech to scale up their innovations and, and 
have in fact been critical partners to most of the top clinical players, certainly seven of the top 10 in vitro diagnostics players globally. We have tens of thousands of clinical installations worldwide and have deep expertise in a number of areas. Of course, development and manufacturing of solutions applied in genomics, in proteomics, in cell and tissue areas. But fundamentally, I mean, what the core expertise of TCAN is, is the understanding, our understanding of the complex nature of samples, be they preclinical samples or patient samples. We look holistically at this complex nature and the end-to-end -end application workflows. We consider the range of bioanalytes that can be interrogated from these samples, and then we design solutions that maximize the insights, whether they're research insights or diagnostic or clinical insights that can be extracted from these samples. So we, we, we do so, for example, by, by reducing the, the manual interventions that are, of course, inefficient and error prone. We automate the sample handling in the chain of custody, and we support the simultaneous extraction and, and fusion of multiple analytes to enable true multiomic capability, which, as you know, is now at the forefront of cancer research, drug development, and diagnostics, and, and of course, therapeutics. So I hope this gives you a sort of a 40,000 foot level of what TCAN is, is, is expert at. Well, I definitely didn't undersell your expertise when I kicked off this interview, that's for Thank sure. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking us through the other capabilities. I actually didn't realize that TCAN had such wide abilities. You mentioned uh, a couple of contributions in research and diagnostic workflows. So I'm hoping you can share some recent examples of TCAN's contributions specifically to automa automating research and again, those diagnostic workflows. Sure. I mean, one of the interesting trends, and we, we keep our eyes very close to the clinical needs, and especially in cancer, and in particular within per the world of personalized medicine. And to give you a recent example of something that TCAN has contributed, uh, we've been looking at how better to support liquid biopsy workflows. In other words, the ability to diagnose, identify, and prognose based on a blood draw from a patient at an early stage, hopefully, of disease development, such as cancer. And so we've developed recently and launched last year something we like to call the phase separator, which is a technology that is in support of full automation of liquid biopsy workflows. And what's really disruptive about it is that it substantially reduces the error rates and, and enables higher speeds, uh, which then enables the handling of thousands and thousands of patient samples per week. And, and incidentally, this technology makes very innovative use of advanced data algorithms and AI in the analysis of these blood samples and the analysis of the signals and the pressure signals that are coming out of them. And, and that's, uh, in fact, you know, one of the major developments we, we've, um, we've launched uh, in, in the last few months. Complementing this, and just in parallel, we talked about liquid biopsy, but there's also the big world of solid tissue biopsy, and that's the world that, of course, Hologic is very familiar with and, and consistent with Hologic's approach with the, the Genius Digital Cytology System. We also enable powerful tools for solid tissue biopsy to automatically extract and purify nucleic acids from various uh, tissue sample types, the key tissue sample types, for subsequent processing downstream. So those are a couple of examples of both technologies that TCAN has developed and deployed that have immediate application in, in the world of cancer, and, and technologies we're also still working on and we hope to, to develop and refine and, and deploy in the very near future. You know, while I always think about the medical device industry as so familial, and your examples really communicate that. My assumption here is that you, you agree with me that we can't do everything alone. We really need to work together. So how does TCAN collaborate with your partners to innovate and enhance their technologies? So you, you've put your finger on, on maybe one of the most important attributes of the healthcare space, which is 
it, it's a vast space, it's a complex space, and it's a space where the underlying science and the underlying understanding of the biology of cancer is changing on a monthly basis. And that, that's very large and very complex. And there is no institution, whether an academic research institution or a, a, a private sector company, large or small, that is big enough and multifaceted enough that they can master the entire space that is evolving quickly. So of course, partnerships and collaborations are absolutely key to, to advance the, the state of the art, the, the state of uh, uh, the, the standard of care in the clinic and, and in drug development. So we bring to the table our mastery of the end-to-end -end workflows across key applications within the life sciences and diagnostics. And we bring to the table a global research and development network that has expertise in the advanced design of instrumentation, of software, informatics, bioinformatics, digitalization, artificial intelligence tools and capabilities, proprietary reagents and disposables, a global manufacturing network, and a very disciplined approach to product development in regulated environments like the clinic and also slightly less regulated environments in the research space, all of it backed up by a very strong quality and regulatory affairs infrastructure. And what our partners bring to the table is their unique expertise in one or several key end applications, certain assays that they want to, to push forward into the clinic. Now, by taking advantage also of TCAN's very innovative portfolio of cutting edge platforms and platform technologies, we're able to very quickly develop optimal solutions that address our customers' time to market imperatives and meet their, their cost of ownership expectations. Because it's important to understand and appreciate that we don't start from zero. We start from a very advanced state of having an array of modular technologies and uh, a, a library, in fact, that can be flexibly configured to, to meet certain uh, ends. And in, in, that, in that sense, we were, for example, integral development partners for Hologic when they developed um, their, their genius cytology system. Uh, one of our uh, companies was instrumental in developing the solutions, the instrument design, the prototyping, the testing, down to the industrial design of the, of the system. And, and that was a, a very good partnership that, that we've had. And, and we have several partnerships along these lines across the space. That's absolutely a testament to your abilities and the community that you've developed. Now, you work with a partner such as Hologic, and I had the great pleasure of learning more about mm -hmm. their genius technology, and uh, it's so validating, gratifying to me, one of the partners to establishing that game-changing technology. <laughs> We'll be back with more of my interview with TCAN here shortly, but I wanted to pick back up the interview with Mike Quick of Hologic. So let's talk actually maybe about cervical cancer screening specifically. So can you talk us through how the Genius system utilizes AI to improve the screening? Sure, absolutely. So the Genius system is really unique in two ways. One, um, in how we're able to generate digital images. Um, so like I said, today, people are using microscopes and looking at, at cells, um, you know, on glass slides. Um, you know, it, it can be very challenging. The, the layers of cells that you actually get that are collected from a patient can make it so that cells can be hiding underneath other cells. Um, and we've developed a technology that's called volumetric imaging that actually allows us to scan in three dimensions um, the cell sample so that we're able to find cells that are underneath other cells and put them all into focus um, for the, uh, a reviewer to, to be able to um, you know, get a better picture of what's going on with that patient. So that's the advanced imaging piece of, of the Genius system. That's really helpful. Um, I know I went really narrow, uh, but I do want to take a few steps back. So mm -hmm. at a higher level, I mean, how is the Genius AI system impacting cytology? We talked about filling the gaps, but have you seen an impact beyond uh, or maybe more specific impacts? Yeah, for sure. Um, 
So we launched the Genius system in Europe first um, ahead of the FDA clearance and we've seen a number of laboratories that have cut down the turnaround time um, because they're so short staffed. You know, they're seeing patients are getting the results back in days instead of weeks. Um, you know, which has a real impact in terms of, I mean, you know what it's like from a patient perspective of, you know, when you have a test like that done, you're waiting for those results to say, is there something wrong or not? Um, and each day that's added to that just makes it that much more anxiety. Um, and we're able to really have that impact by having a more efficient, more accurate review with the Genius system. That makes me question, what about inconclusive results? Because I remember... From my personal experience, there was a lot of, I'd finally get the results, but they were inconclusive and we'd have to try again. We'd have to try again. Has this system made any impact in that, in that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's more definitive um, in terms of the, being able to provide the results that we do. It's also more reproducible because what we're doing is essentially distilling tens of thousands of cells down to the most clinically relevant area um, for a pathologist or a cytologist to review. So you're kind of being able to get a much more clear focus. So you get much higher reproducibility, something that calls it, you're going to get a higher agreement rate um, than you would if you're looking at all, you know, 70, 80,000 cells on a slide. Um, and that's really where AI comes in um, as being able to provide that focus um, in terms of the review. Very, very helpful for the clarification. And also, once again, for another question, uh, as you were developing the Genius system, was there always this understanding that it would be utilizing artificial intelligence for kind of from the beginning? Yeah, very much so. So we actually have a long history of using, um, you know, AI, even before it was necessarily called AI. Um, we did image analysis um, with our first product that was approved back in 2003. Um, and is now the way that most um, tests are being done in the U.S. ahead of the Genius launch. So we've been involved in this space for a long time. It's just the technology has really evolved. And so now we're using what would be you know, considered maybe true AI in the context of like deep learning algorithms, um, where we're able to use advanced technologies to really improve, um, you know, the output, um, even ahead of what we were able to do a couple decades ago. A couple decades? I didn't expect you to actually say decades. <laughs> the more I'm learning is that artificial intelligence has been around, but hasn't really been named AI. You know, it's been um, under digital health, um, I you had just actually mentioned a uh, descriptor for it. Have you, like, in your role at Hologic, did you always feel as though, let's see, you could do, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this, like, to, you'd be able to do more with this technology behind you? Yeah, ab absolutely. It really became an enabler. Both, and it's really in both areas, too, the imaging um, and the AI. You know, if we think back to where they were um you know, even a couple decades ago, they weren't where we are today. I mean, the interesting thing, you could even go back further, like this, the first idea of doing these automated cytology um, uh, type of systems goes all the way back to the 50s. But if you think about what cameras and computers were like in the 1950s, the technology just didn't exist. So sometimes when I think about innovation, um, you definitely have to have a good idea. But so much of it is about timing. You know, is the technology that supports the good idea available or can you develop that? Um, you know, is the toolbox available that's going to make that a reality? And it, this was just the perfect lineup of the timing of what the problem to be solved was where there was an unmet need. And the technology that we developed kind of lined up perfectly for us to be able to bring this to the market. I've spoken like a true innovator. I love that. <laughs> Well, I think you'd probably agree with me, Mike, when I say that AI is a complement, not a replacement. So can we talk about perhaps the feedback that you've been getting from fellow cytologists and pathologists, um, based, uh, specifically about the Genius AI system? Um, but if you could just keep the scope to artificial intelligence, so cytologists and pathologists feedback on the AI side. <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, and the AI, the AI component you know can be scary to be honest. I think that you know some people have ideas about what it can mean for their jobs. You know, is it going to replace them? And the way we've often um, positioned it, really in terms of our products, is really that it's complementary. It's not that AI is better than the human, or the human is better than AI, but the two together are better than either one alone. Um, and so we really do come alongside as enabling technology to 
allow people to do what they do today, but even better. Um, and that's the way we'll continue to, to um, you know, train our, our users and being able to implement the technology. So you absolutely understand the intention of that question. I was trying to really understand, you know, has there been a resistance to adopting AI, uh, which I think that you agree that there has been in general a resistance. Are you seeing that resistance maybe uh, being more open or so less of a resistance, more openness to embracing AI? Absolutely. And it really comes down to where there's an unmet need. Um, it'd be, I think, different if there was a plethora of cytologists and pathologists that were just twiddling their thumbs waiting for work to come in. The reality is they're all facing the daily pressures of not having enough people to do the work that's there to be able to provide quality results for, for patients. This is a technology that allows them to continue to offer the best standard of care for those patients in a way that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. So almost in a way of having a, another colleague on your team who doesn't sleep, doesn't eat, <laughs> just analyzes data at the utmost quick pace. Uh, that would be nice. I think we all need one of those. <laughs> Uh, I think our, one of I think what I'm not I'm not in marketing, but I think one of our marketing messages is about like adding our genius to yours. Um, you know, it's the the idea of it's not a replacement for you, but it's really en enhancing what you do today. Oh, I love that. And I actually recently sat in on a keynote session and I'm not going to mention who the keynote speaker was, but he had used the phrase AI is helping our collective genius. So I think that's kind of to your point yeah. as well. So kudos yeah. to the marketing team because they're hitting the nail there where, <laughs> you know, isn't just one genius and one genius. It's like this collective genius. And then it's enabled, enabling right. much better outcomes, quicker, the rapid speed to market or the rapid speed to a test results, which is so, so important. Right. And this will be the last time I bring back Dr. Y.L. Yared. CTO of Tekin. Well, you you mentioned a couple of things that I would love to learn more about. You were talking about this idea of modular technology with your um, your mm -hmm. other uh, teammates is a, a good way of putting it. Right. But you also hit on my favorite word, artificial intelligence. Uh, if I could just ask you a couple of off-the-cuff questions, we absolutely don't have to keep them in, but would mm -hmm. you mind giving us an, your personal perspective on artificial intelligence? How do you define AI? So that's a great question, and, and it, of course it's a topic which is talked about a lot uh, these days. And in fact, it's a topic which, in fairness, has been contributing to the life sciences and to medicine for many, many years. Uh, well before the large language models came to the attention of the public, so to speak. But there is a lot of really valuable um, information and insight and contribution that has come out of artificial intelligence. And to, to touch on your question, you know, how do we define it? It's basically the ability to analyze data, large reams of data, organize that information and derive insights, extract insights out of it, automatically, without programming those insights, without building a model, but having the system generate a certain understanding and generate a certain um, uh, uh, set of approaches. In other words, automated learning systems, and that's how we define AI. And we've been, in fact, uh, major proponents of the development and application of artificial intelligence techniques across a number of areas that we are directly involved in such as, for example, imaging and detection and image analysis, and applying such tools like classifiers to automatically recognize cells and cell pathologies and learn from annotations of cells is a big contribution um, from AI into the space, and there are many, many others. Uh, I mentioned in a, uh, a few minutes ago our development of this phase separator module for liquid biopsies. Well, this is, again, an application of advanced data mining techniques and artificial intelligence techniques to extract the exact information that is needed in order to produce the samples that then can be subsequently analyzed in a liquid biopsy workflows. We're looking also at how artificial intelligence is able to um, 
uh, apply, you know, how, how people are able to apply these techniques to, for example, uh, understand disease management at the population level and build virtual twins at the population level to understand what could be the potential benefit of earlier stages of detection. These are complex, uh, complex problems, and the search space of possibilities is so vast that you actually need an artificial intelligence system to, to, to keep track of all these possibilities and, and mine them and make recommendations. Those, those are just a few examples. I feel like I can talk to you for another hour about this alone, <laughs> but I can't. Uh, I love what, some of the things that you said that I wanted just to highlight here is there's this artificial intelligence can help with a technical lift. It can help mm -hmm. with a workflow lift. Uh, it can help humans be more human. Uh, because it removes those other sort of time um, uh, sensitive jobs that can be better given to a technology as opposed to a human. And it really changes the way that we think about the future. So talking about the future, I want to shift us there. But first, what everything that you shared with us is, is so interesting. Where do you see the future of artificial intelligence, maybe in relation to uh, cancer research, uh, in relation to the life sciences industry as a whole? Where do you mm -hmm. see it bringing us in the next five years? Well, it, it's obviously coming to the forefront in a number of areas. And I would start with some of the basics in fundamental research and analyzing the very complex and interconnected nature of analytes in the very complex physiology of a human being. It is also making its, its imprint in, in the drug discovery, drug development, drug optimization, analyzing the results of clinical trial, tr trials. Uh, the ability to, to simulate molecular dockings predict, predict not only the shape of proteins, but the interaction between proteins and small molecules, proteins and other proteins, proteins and ions and modified residues. All of this is now very powerfully enabled by AI. But if I may take a step back and, and remind ourselves, artificial intelligence is a very powerful set of tools, but tools that are deployed to, to, to an end, right? And for us, what matters is ultimately making a difference, making an impact on patient survival, on, on, on patient standard of care. And so we look really at what the underserved needs are in the clinic. What are the unsolved problems today? What, what is that entire space going? What are the overall clinical trends? So we're seeing a very powerful clinic, clinical trend towards personalized medicine, for example. The ability to match the particular pathology of a unique patient to a certain subtype and variant and mutational or, or, or not um, uh, of a certain disease and, and stratify the diagnosis and the, and the treatment stream of that patient. We talked about multiomics before, the ability to extract signals from orthogonal data sets that come from vastly different sciences and fuse them together and produce better insight. Single cell workflows, a third very powerful trend that we're seeing the ability to interrogate the unit of life, which is the living cell of one human being in order to understand really what is going on at the cellular level. And obviously, you know, propelling all of this forward into the clinic is the growth of gene and cell therapy approaches. All of these are important clinical trends that we are deeply enmeshed with, keep a very close eye on, and work together with some of the partners, uh, some of the key partners uh, who are moving that space forward. Um, and, and all of these trends that I mentioned, I mean, if you sort of take them back to a very humble pedestrian instrument design level, these have a deep impact on the instrumentation, on the end-to-end -end solution requirements. For example, the ability to handle ever smaller uh, uh, volumes, sample volumes from patients. Uh, so you, you have less of an impact, uh, less of an invasive impact on, on, on a patient. The ability to connect larger fleets of instruments that are doing complex things 
with robust awareness of the instrument health and, and utilization in order to better serve the, the, the diagnostics labs and the hospitals. Um, fusing and managing orthogonal data sets, as we mentioned, across global deployments uh, around the globe. Scaling down the capital intensity demands for, for example, sterile clean room uh, environments so we can decentralize and bring cutting edge cell and gene therapy uh, manufacturing closer to the patient. All of these are, are important impacts on the physical instrumentation that is deployed in order to serve these, these important uh, clinical trends. Well, Dr. Wael Yared, thank you very much for joining me in Device Talks AI. I wish I could continue talking to you because this has been really thrilling, but I really appreciate your time and thank you again. Thank you very much, Kelly, and I, I enjoyed the conversation. And we're back with Mike Quick of Hologic. Enjoy. We are talking a little bit about data and clinical evidence. Do you have any statistics or data that you can share with us that's maybe even another way to show any resistors that this really is a wonderful, friendly future? Yeah, ab absolutely. So we've, we've had, I think, our first publication that came out of the European team. There was a large laboratory in Germany um, that did a comparison that showed that they saw significant increases um, in in accuracy and also um, in improvements in efficiency um, in, in a, a peer-reviewed publication um, out of one of our labs in Germany. And, and then more recently with the FDA clearance, obviously there was a pivotal clinical trial. Um, that data has not yet been published, um, but is available through our um, FDA website that talks about you know, the improved um, uh, from an accuracy standpoint, um, as well as the efficiency that can be gained using the Genius system. So we're just, it's early days, um, but we are seeing clinical evidence that's backing up the support of the system. Well, I can't wait to dig into that. So thank you for sharing. So you mentioned the pivotal trial clinical data that now leads me to what I was really excited at the beginning of our conversation to talk through the FDA pathway. So what are some of the hurdles, opportunities, challenges that you found going through this absolutely uncharted water? Sure, absolutely. So the, um, the path that we go down in, in this case, um, you know, FDA calls it a de novo um, pathway, which just means it's new or novel and that there's nothing else to compare to. You know, a common path in the FDA is they, you know, a new device will compare to something else that's similar um, and, and then measure their performance against that. When you have something that's truly novel, there isn't anything to compare to. So it's hard to gauge, you know, what's good enough and, and what, what are you comparing to in terms of the standard of care and do the benefits of the technology outweigh any potential risks um, associated with it. So it's a challenging process to go down, um, but it's one that that certainly was the path we wanted to go um, you know, with the FDA. And we started very early on um, with our discussions with them so that we could really learn together um, about going down this path. I love that you said learn together. I think that's the really only way that just us as an industry moves forward in the right way, but us really embracing artificial intelligence and uh, trying to have those conversations with the FDA sooner than later. So that in mind, for your fellow innovators, do you have any advice for going through the FDA and forging their own path? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is engaging early and often. Um, as I mentioned, they are learning, um, and and it's not static. Um, you know, their learnings continue to shape how they're viewing devices, how they're continuing to, um, you, you know, think about regulations, about how to direct sponsors, you know, in a path that makes them, um, you know, really work together as partners um, in the, bringing this technology um, to market. I think it's easy to, um, you know, complain about, um, you know, the pace of innovation. But the reality is, is that they're as eager as we are to be able to bring life-saving technologies to patients across the U.S. And so being able to take that approach um, and truly a partnership, um, you know, is really the best path forward. That's very endearing and very validating, I think, because I've seen that from the very beginning. There's always been this sort of wall between the FDA and innovators and I never really understood that wall. And in, I think I mentioned two decades of experience, it's really been in the last five years where I've been seeing this more 
relationship forward with the FDA, starting to communicate with them sooner, uh, give as much information as possible, and then allow them the opportunity to be a collaborator as well, as opposed to feeling like you have to have everything to present, you know, think of the FDA as a partner, uh, which yeah. sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really the only way, um, you know, to get down that path. I, I will say, you know, on the spectrum, you could probably think about as having innovation on one end and regulation on the other. Um, but in the middle is the patient. And, and that's where I think that we both want to focus on, you know, what's safe for patients, but also what makes a difference in terms of life-saving technologies. And, you know, in any time during the, that cycle, the pendulum may swing one way or the other where you're like, I wish you were a little bit more innovative or the regulatory side was less burdensome. Um, but at the heart, we all want what's best for patients. Um, and I think as long as that remains the focus, then I think we come to it in a way that's mutually beneficial. Oh, here, here, Mike. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. Carrying on the theme of partnerships, how do you approach collaborations and partnerships outside of the FDA? So with other organizations in um, like in terms of like Hologics partnerships specifically, like how do you approach that? Sure. Yeah. So um, we partner with professional societies, um, you know, throughout the U.S. and really throughout the world. Um, and, and that, you know, comes from the standpoint of education. You know, we, we present at meetings, we support educational conferences so that we're able to you know, get the message out about where there are unmet needs and where technologies can help support them. Um, we also work together in terms of jet data generation um, that can inform, you know, future policies. And so you think about you know, how often should women get screened? What technology should be used? Um, and being able to help shape that and generate the data that helps inform what those decisions are is really critical. Um, and so we know we can't do it alone. That truly takes a community and you get perspectives, not just of the laboratory, not just of industry, but even OBGYNs, the physicians and patient advocacy groups. And so we've got partnerships really across the board um, when it comes to breast cancer and cervical cancer, those are our key areas of focus. So it allows us to really, um, you know, dig in deep in those areas across the different functional groups. It makes me really happy to hear that there is this openness for collaboration. And I second everything that you're saying. Once again, continuing on the thread of partnerships and collaborations. So the Genius AI system has a remote capability, so remote collaboration. Can you talk us through how that functions and then how do you envision that functionality improving maybe patient access and um, you know really even health equity. Absolutely. So one of the, one of the biggest challenges globally, from the perspective of glo- of cervical cancer, is that the majority of women that develop cervical cancer were never screened and didn't have access to the to screening technologies. And you think about parts of the world. You know, I've worked for the better part of a decade um, in Latin America, Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, and just recognized there was a huge deficit in terms of screening programs um, and said, you know, how can we help develop technology that allows us to be um, able to, to bring this life saving technology to those parts of the world? Um, you know, one of the the things you've probably heard folks say before is, you know, where you live shouldn't determine whether or not if you live. Um, And so being able to separate the idea of we may not have the programs that train cytologists or pathologists in a given country, but that shouldn't be a limiting um, barrier to being able to get women screened in those countries. So Genius really enables that by being able to separate where the expert reviewers are from where the samples are from a patient perspective and really bringing those two together. I just think that if if it's okay, if you could just repeat that phrase one more time about, um, like you had mentioned something that I've heard before, and I definitely nodded emphatically, but I think that needs to be said louder for those in the back. (laughs) Just, do you remember the exact phrase? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, You know, one of our fundamental beliefs is that where you live shouldn't determine whether or not if you live. And Genius really allows us to bring the technology to where the patients are rather than being dependent upon where there may not be expert reviewers. That's really special and kind of strange that I asked you to say it again, but I think it's really important. And that illustrates exactly what not just you, but your teammates are trying to achieve and what our industry as a whole is trying to achieve. It's one of the differentiators, I think, between the medical device industry stakeholders and outside of our industry. It's really, really special. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I want to shift 
our, our discussion, Mike, to the future. So from your perspective, within the next five years, where do you see the future of cytology specifically with these AI-assisted technologies, algorithms, and so on? I think the future of cytology is very exciting. One of the things I'm sure you've heard more and more talk about is the idea of personalized medicine um, and also minimally invasive procedures. And cytology really ticks the boxes on both of those. So by being able to get relatively easy samples from patients, you're able to get new insights into ways that may um, diagnose disease or even better manage treatment decisions based on that. Um, and I think AI can play a huge role in being able to bring the same technology that we've brought for cervical cancer to a whole host of additional applications in the future. I second that, uh, and I'm excited for that future. Maybe now even more broadly, so just from your own personal Hologic aside perspective, within the next five years, where do you think we could be with this embracing of AI, that generative AI in particular has really helped not just our industry and outside of industry, but what could our future look like in the next five years? Yeah, AI is an exciting and really enabling technology. Um, you know, I want to be clear, AI in and of itself isn't good or bad. It's really how the technology can be used to advance, um, and in our space, really around diagnostic medicine. What's going to be really exciting is when we can move beyond not just automating tasks that are done maybe inefficiently with humans, but actually to places where AI can see things that we can't see with our eyes today. When we get new insights about this patient will respond to this therapy or this patient will progress with this disease or respond better to this treatment. Those are things that we have a really hard time seeing today, but that AI trained well and trained properly absolutely has that possibility in the future. Oh, I mean, it's the perfect way, I think, to end our conversation full of hope and steps we can take today. So with that, Mike Quick, VP of Research and Development and Innovation for Cytology Oncology at Hologic. Thank you again for spending your time with us at Device Talks AI. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kayleen. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Device Talks AI. Please, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network. You can do that on any major podcast platform. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts. There we are. We are Device Talks, one word. Also, please subscribe to us on YouTube. You can watch all of our video podcasts, and we have some other great content on our Device Talks YouTube. That is D-E-V-I-C-E-T-A-L-K-S, Device Talks. My name, once again, is Kayleen Brown. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. That's K-A-Y-L-E-E-N brown just like the color send me a message tell me your med tech story i love meeting the community and learning more about how you live the industry why you live the industry and what you're doing to support patient health and better patient outcomes once again thank you very much for listening to the device talks podcast network coming next is another episode of device talks weekly with the incomparable tom salemi we appreciate you and we'll check you out next time